Alright, uh, I'm Carlos Oms and I'll be presenting Boris to you today. So, uh, first off, uh, as you can see here, the first example of a parry, Dark Souls, uh, this kind of exemplifies as kind of a meme the whole concept of the parry. It's a very satisfying move, a very skilled move, and it requires a lot of practice and experience with the game mechanics, depending on the game that you're playing. And we're going to analyze uh, step by step why and how you should make a parry and the concept itself. So this is something I found when I, wa when I was doing research, which is parrying in video games is life. I will make a game with it one day or I will not have lived. Uh, this is not anyone important, just some guy that I found in the comment section of Know Your Meme. But man, did I relate to that, to this sentence. Uh, I love parries as a concept, and I want to make games with parries. And I technically already participated in the making of a parry of a game, which I, we will get later on. But I need to make more. This kind of, it's kind of a drug. You need to make more parries. So first off, what is a parry? As a baseline concept, it's to ward off a weapon or blow. So basically it's to deflect an incoming attack. If we look at the definitions of giant bomb, uh, fighting games nomenclature, we have these three concepts, the counter, the parry and the repost. The counter is uh, to attack an enemy after blocking a move of his. A parry is a specialized block with a very tight input window, which prevents you from taking damage. And a repost is to counterattack immediately after successfully making a parry. So basically, in this, uh, with this nomenclature, the difference between a repost and a counter would be to make a parry instead of a regular block. So if you make a parry, it's a repost. If you make a regular block, it's a counter. However, in my opinion, it's kind of a little messy. Because there's a lot of information, or at least I found a lot of different characteristics of... Uh, parries, which are not super defined in these concepts. For example, a parry leaves the opponent vulnerable, or it's just a precise block action. On Street Fighter, it's a time block, and you just block, while in Dark Souls, you stun your opponent, and you leave him wide open for a following repost, which is optional, but most of the time it's performed. Attacking after a parry is a repost, or does it have to be all in one action? In For Honor, you make a time to block, and then you make a voluntary attack input to make an attack and a repost. But in Monster Hunter, you block and you make the attack all in one. So you are not blocking and then you decide to attack. No, you are attacking and parrying at, with the same action. And what even is a counter? A counter is both an action that you can do apparently, and, and the status between game elements like rock, paper, scissors, or characters in a MOBA or units in a strategy game. They're, they're things that by property uh, counter each other. So in general, the definitions are not all that clear, but what I think is that it's a matter of layers. A counter involves an effect or strategy that nullifies or overcomes another. This can be a specific move, but also a, a strategy, a unit, an element of a game, like water and fire. Then a parry is a precise timed counter which blocks an incoming attack. So here we add the layer of timing and precision. You are doing a counter, but you're doing a counter in a specific move, a very precise move. And then repost is to perform an offensive action with a parry or immediately after using one. So here we get another layer, which is counter-attack. You're no longer just protecting yourself from an attack, you're no longer just doing it very precisely, but you're also you're using the opening that the parry gives you to get back at the enemy. But all in all, it depends, it depends on the game and genre. Uh, and this presentation will focus mainly on the parry as a way to precisely block the incoming blow with or without a counter-attack that accompanies it. And we'll do that uh, so just to simplify overall, so we don't have to refer to this is a parry, this is a repost, because every game refers to it in a different way, so we'll just keep it simple and call everything a parry from now on, or a counter, or whatever. So here is the thickness. How and why are parries awesome? 
First off, we'll look at it from a how to design a party perspective on the different elements that a party has, which makes it uh, an interesting mechanic, but also how it affects the player. Why should you have a party, and why in the concept of why players like parties, what it involves in the player engagement uh, category, and why you should have it in your games. A party is a meaningful choice. You don't just party something. You commit to a party. You decide to party. It is a voluntary display of skill, confidence, and precision. It is the move of a master. As you can see in this GIF, uh, this guy doesn't just party the move. He is already committed to the move and has prepared it way beforehand the attack comes to him. So it's something about preparation, skill, and knowledge about the game. And now we'll look at this video for its entirety, because it's an a five minute analysis of the parry, and I think it's great. One of the most impressive moments in boxing history took place during a 1977 exhibition match between Muhammad Ali and Michael Dokes. Finding himself in the ring's corner, Ali managed to dodge 21 punches thrown by Dokes in just 10 seconds. This left Dokes completely bewildered at Ali's impressive speed and ability to read his opponents, and after that, Ali even punished the whiffs with a taunt. His speed, timing, and knowledge of his opponents separated him heavily from other boxers in terms of skill level. This occurrence of gaining advantage from reading an opponent exists in many other sports, but it also translates over into video games in the form of the parry. The parry mechanic can be seen in games like Cuphead, Dark Souls, Assassin's Creed, For Honor, and lots and lots of fighting games. In all of these games, the parry exists as a defensive mechanic that negates your opponent's attack as a reward for perfect timing. It requires high hand-eye coordination, knowledge of your opponent's attack style, and some confidence that you won't end up botching it and opening yourself up to your opponent for an embarrassing punish. There's many examples of that in real-life combat sports as well. Anderson. Oh, man, he got hit! Look at the finish it! It is all over! Just like it! However, when you successfully land it, it's incredibly satisfying no matter what game you're playing. Part of the reason why parrying and fighting games can be so satisfying is related to its visual and sound design paired with overall game feel. In Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, a successful parry will result in a white spark animation, a text prop under your health that says tech bonus, and a sharp impact sound effect. This gives you the full scope of fulfillment for taking the gamble successfully in the form of both audio and visual feedback. A different example is Tekken's low parry mechanic. When landed, it will result in an animation of your opponent being thrown to the ground on their back, paired with a low-pitched thud sound effect. While the visual and audio presentation is more blunt than its 2D counterpart, this still does not take away from the sheer excitement you get from the game feel of creatively reading your opponent and capitalizing on that information. In a 2015 interview with Kotaku, EVO co-founder and former Capcom employee Seth Killian said, quote, Street Fighter 3's parry system was arguably the biggest single mechanics change in the history of Street Fighter. Parrying didn't require any meter resource to perform, so it was always available to both players and was fantastic for turning formerly static or predictable situations into exciting mind games. Every button you touched carried a new element of risk, and it created a huge opportunity for comebacks from previously impossible situations. In competitive play, parrying is used fairly often, making it an essential tool in a pro's arsenal. However, like Seth Killian said, this does not take away from the excitement factor of its appearance. After all, the undisputed greatest moment in fighting game history is all thanks to the parry. At EVO 2004, Street Fighter Third Strike was in full swing, and the Grand Finals matchup was between Justin Wong playing Chun-Li and Daigo Mahara playing Ken. In the final round of Match 1, Daigo found himself losing a lot of health to Justin's very safe and calculated Chun-Li play. Justin continued to turtle Daigo's Ken down to nothing but a pixel of health, and with under 30 seconds left in the round, his Chun-Li was at max meter. This was the absolute worst possible scenario for Daigo, as even if he blocked the super, the chip damage he would take from guarding would be enough to knock him out. Having excellent game sense, Justin knew this and proceeded to initiate Chun-Li's 15-hit super art, aiming to secure the win. However, what he didn't expect was for history to be made. <laughs> Against all odds, Daigo parried all 15 hits with near frame-perfect accuracy, countered the final kick, and followed up with a super art of his own to take match one. 
The jam-packed room of spectators erupted in applause and cemented this event in history, known simply today as Moment 37. Daigo earned his permanent place in the Fighting Game Hall of Fame that day in 2004, and it was all thanks to his expert use of the parry. Daigo and Muhammad Ali shared the same moment that day. They both used expert skills to slip into the mind of their opponent and rendered their attacks useless, a quality that is essential to mastering the parry. Today, the parry is just as important and exciting as it was in the past. The mechanic still produces exciting gameplay in modern titles like Tekken 7, Street Fighter V, Guilty Gear, and many more. This feature is one of the many reasons why fighting games remain so impressive on a pro level. The legendary parries of the past continue to inspire dedicated players to keep learning more and more about the game they play, so that they can eventually rely on their knowledge of moves and game mechanics to maintain control. So this video explains a lot of information about the parry, but I really liked how it related it to uh, a real life boxer and the whole uh, topic of reading your opponent because uh, most of the times, and we'll talk about this, a parry is not something that you reflect it, you do by reflex, though it can happen. It's something that you see coming and then you perform a parry. And uh, as we saw in that spectacular move of Street Fighter 3, the, just the existence of a parry in a video game uh, makes it so this kind of comebacks are possible at all because if, it, if there wasn't a parry available, uh, just by blocking, he will he would have gotten enough cheap damage to die. So he decided to take the high risk route because there was no other choice and parry every single attack to survive the encounter. And I think that's one of the great potentials of the parry. So following this video, on the design side, we have clarity. So attacks have to be clearly distinctive. Uh, because the player must recognize the incoming blow quickly to think of an adequate response. So in this example, we see in this GIF of For Honor, we can see that there's uh, these three stances, which you can block up, right or left, but the incoming attacks not only have uh, in-game UI with a red arrow that marks where the attack is coming from, but also the animation itself, it's really clear where the attack is going to. Which side do you have to block? And this information has to be clear because it's necessary. Making a parry is making a risk, a commitment of risk, and a conscious choice. And if there, if the information to make that choice is not clear, then it gets diluted, and it creates insecurity for the player because uh, Making a par is a high because making a par is high risk choice. It needs to also to be a minimally secure choice, and not identifying quick enough how you should parry that attack, the incentivizes the wanting to parry that attack. On the second hand, we have player knowledge, which for the player a parry is another toolbox on your combat uh, abilities, which needs knowledge and experience. It demands you to read your opponent and predict his moves to counter them. So now it's not only about uh, this attack makes more damage, this other attack makes less damage, but also the fact that one of the two players, if both are capable to parry, one of them could parry at any moment. And that makes an, an interesting battleground to be in. And we'll now watch this video, which is from Team Fortress, a guy called uh, Lazy Purple which made a video called How It Feels to Play Pyro, which talks about many things, but there's this section that talks about a very interesting ability, which is the Pyroblast, which is able to return explosives. But most importantly, I reflect. <laughs> but with Pyroblast, you can take advantage of the predictable rockets that level three sentries shoot. Come on! That's bullshit! You are a stupid sentry! Oh, I'm gonna lay you out! Air Blast gives you a fighting chance against soldiers that are just outside your range! No, God, do it! Oh no! In this clip, I reflect one rocket, I reflect two rockets, I reflect three rockets, and even hit him! I reflect four rockets! There's no way he would even think of shooting another- You fool! 
But the one thing you have to remember is to not shoot at the enemy pyro when your teammates are around. It is at this juncture that I must reveal my bias. Air Blast is by far my favorite part of playing Pyro. I love the challenge of having to switch my brain to the mindset of a demo man or soldier to be able to hit clutch reflex. So to analyze uh, what we just seen in this video, uh, firstly, I just wanted to show the video originally, but then I realized that uh, we could more make a more in-depth analysis of it. So what we just saw is that Pyroblast requires knowledge to a certain extent uh, because you can return explosives but what we show in the engineer section of that video he explained that if a turret is level 3 you can deflect the rockets back to it but if you can do it even better and you can reflect the rockets of the turret to the engineer that will be nearby to kill it and then take care of the turret when it's out of protection, which would be its engineer. It makes up a, a threat. Uh, the fact that the pyro can pyroblast is already a threat itself. A pyro could be out of ammunition and be unable to pyroblast, and still another soldier which has explosives that can be returned by the pyroblast, that pyro is a threat. Because the mere fact that he could pyroblast is already a problem. So the fact that the pyro is present with his party in the battlefield creates an interesting dynamic between characters. And also punishment. A uh, good pyro will take any chance to blast your own explosives. So as I said, uh, the pyro creates a threat, but every time that a soldier or a demo man thinks he can sneak one in uh, and sneak explosive to a pyro, if the pyro is skilled enough, he will return it right back. And he can even strategize around that. Uh, if someone is dumb enough to uh, spam explosives to a pyro, that pyro can deflect those explosives to enemies instead, instead of the source of explosions. And there's even skill layers, uh, because aiming a rocket back at the target is better than simply deflecting it away. So as in the last section of the video, uh, he not only stops attacks from damaging him, but he also takes the time and uh, practice to learn how to return those projectiles because rockets go at a certain velocity and go in a straight line while demo man explosives do kind of a, an arc. They have weight and when you return those uh, projectiles it's like you're shooting them so they have that weight as well. Uh, this is just kind of a intermission which is I seriously recommend uh, this series and this youtuber which is called lazy purple which makes a lot of videos of TF2 and he made a series he started a series some time ago which is called how it Pleal, how it feels to play TF2 and I seriously recommend it because not only because it's extremely funny but also because it makes a pretty in-depth commentary about the gameplay design of the game and you can really see a lot how much depth was put inside the whole character dynamic between not only the way that it, they're played themselves, but how each character relates to each other on their characters and abilities, the whole combat system between characters. So in the next section of the party, we have, from the design perspective, we have the anticipation. Uh, you have to telegraph the attacks. There must be enough time for the player to observe and react, otherwise it becomes gambling. So if in the previous section we discussed about being clear, here it's about anticipating your movements. Uh, even if it's a short time, there has to be enough time for the player to make a conscious decision. And here we'll see a small video about Nergigante in Monster Hunter World, which does an excellent job at tele telegraphing attacks. But this is how a lot of the same thing that clarity isn't anticipation and, clair and clarity. Uh, I, thought, to tell I thought the same. The it is kind of the same, but it, I want to focus different things. On uh, clarity, it's about making different moves distinctive. For example, you could have two moves that are incredibly similar to each other but are different in some way, like where the attack lands. 
but both have the same time to execute. So clarity refers to the difference between different attacks. So just as the attack starts, you can identify that's the, that's the attack of all the attacks that he can make, that's the one. And I know that one because I've seen it before. Anticipation also relates to that, but I want to focus here more about the time of giving time for the player to react. The first section is about uh, giving specific information to differentiate between all the information in the game, which are the different attacks. And here's about giving time to process that information. Okay, we are talking about tiny windows right now, isn't it? Yes. So here okay. we can see this monster, which has different attacks, but as you can see, even if there's like half a second, he doesn't instantly attack. There's a very small time window, as he, Juan said, which he's telling you what he's about to do. And a skilled enough player has milliseconds to realize what he's doing, to identify that move and to evade it, or parry it if you have a weapon that allows you to do that. And this is super important, because once you learn a monster in Monster Hunter World and you memorize the different animations, you are no longer running away from the monster, you're dancing with it. You're seeing what he's going to do, you're evading at the last second, and you're taking this time opportunity window as well, because when he finishes an attack, you also have like half a second where he's just recovering from that attack, and you have a time window to punish him if you manage to evade that attack, or parry it. So, uh, time windows, super important, both to uh, s uh, acquire information, be able to read it, and also to uh, to be have the time to actually make a move and use uh, use the time f to make a counter attack if you manage to evade the the incoming attack. I would like to make a question. Yes. When you, uh, when we are talking about time of uh, windows, uh, usually in most games uh, we say that for a player to react, uh, you need at least twelve frames. However, if you are going to perform a parry, I, Im I imagine that the preparation and the idea, all that adds to that f frame uh, window. Yes. How many frames would, would you say it is correct to that anticipation to be approach? If I remember correctly, uh, Joan told me that it was about 300 milliseconds, uh, 400 milliseconds for a player to uh, get uh, an input from the screen make a quick, very quick decision, and then act upon that. However, it the more... 240. 40, sorry. In 240 milliseconds, you, you, you need to spend 100 milliseconds to get all the input and all the, all the data coming from the computer. Then you need to spend like, uh, uh, like I can't remember exactly in my memories. Um, I think that another hundred of milliseconds to process this data and try to make a, uh, a decision, you know, to take a decision. And then finally, uh, I, can, I can remember exactly where I'm going to, to take a look on this, uh, this topic and tell you exactly. But it, it, it is, this is, an, uh, an, you know, uh, a perfect situation. You know, if you have the perfect human being, you know, okay. in your game, so you, you will need at least 240 uh, milliseconds. But the, the, the thing is that games usually give you more time because you are not the perfect human, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. Give you 300 or 400 milliseconds. And so this is a good idea too. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think this relates pretty well to the next part, which is reflexes. If a player uh, knows uh, w the what an attack is and what it's going to do and how to counter it, the more knowledge a player has and the more the most reflex capabilities that he has, the shorter the time window needed. So a parry requires fast reflexes and mo fast reflexes and most importantly quick decision making, the capability to swiftly perceive events and act accordingly. And as we can see in this uh, Battlefield 4 GIF, uh, some guy goes for a knife kill, but he can counter that knife, he presses the button at that specific moment. The first time that you get attack, attacked by a knife uh, in the front, you will get, you will die. 
But when you see that input of counter knife, you'll say, what was that? And then you start this process of learning that you can counter knife. And then when you become a veteran, to say it that way, uh, one, when a guy is trying to knife you up front, you will already, just as the animation start, you already know what is going to happen and what you have to do. So you have the combination of uh, reflecting to incoming inputs of the game, making a decision and then waiting for the right moment to strike. Next up, we have timing from the design perspective. Uh, a parry requires a small window of opportunity. If the window is too small, it might become impossible and the risk be too high for what the, the reward it gives. And But if it's too big, uh, it's effortless to do a parry, so parry becomes a default move, and it becomes being a skilled, uh, a skilled movement. So this is kind of a, a joke, to be honest, the, this video I've put in, but the more I looked at it, the more I thought, oh, wait, this is not as bad of an example for a parry. So here we can see three Roy's in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which can parry, and you have this guy, that is about to make a parry, uh, this about to make an attack, and the other guy will see it coming and make a parry. So this is kind of a conflict between when is he going to actually stop loading and make an attack? So it involves these mind games, but it's a parry based on uh, prediction. There's, I think there's way too little time between a fini like starting the attack and actually getting hit to do a parry by reflex. There's not enough time. You have to predict when is he going to hit and parry just a little bit beforehand. And that's exactly what he does. And then they start, <laughs> everyone starts to parry each other and the GameCube dies. So the first parry was a prediction, but all the other parries after that were reflex. Because they were getting hit, jumping away, but instantly after getting hit, parrying again to parry one of the other parries. So the first was preparation, and the other was instant reflex. Very quick movements. Uh, for the player, uh, this is a matter of precision. To parry is to have harmony between intention and action. It needs accurate foresight and psychomotor skills. Uh, and here we'll see an example of Sekiro, which I think it's, uh, I think it's a masterpiece. This specific clip. Like, the whole encounter just emits mastery, you know, the, 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 the sound of the swords clashing, the movements, the quick reflexes, the, the knowledge of both the AI to react and the player to react to the enemy's attacks, it feels masterful. And the player is able to do that because he has probably spent a ton of time with that enemy and practicing the parry, and now that he's able to parry consistently, he can circumvent the enemy attacks. He doesn't have to be afraid or in a defense mode. He can go straight forward towards him because he has the confidence and the skill to return his attacks back right at him. Uh, next up, we'll talk about... Oh, by the way, uh, I think I heard that Ria say something before. No, it's just a commentary about the initial boss that it really feels masterful, but it's quite a nightmare to get there. <laughs> yeah, w w something I didn't play Sekiro myself, but something very interesting that a friend told me some time ago is that the parries in Sekiro weren't as meaningful because they were mandatory. Uh, meaning that uh, in Sekiro, you have to parry if you want to play. Con uh, consistently, like being able to play well. So when you make a parry... Yeah. A second? No, that I completely agree with uh, mm -hmm. that stance. They don't feel that uh, good because you don't... 
it's not like a master's choice, it's the only choice. You are forced to parry if you want to actually make it out of the game. And I think it's an interesting element to take into account as well. If you make a parry a necessity instead of a masterful choice, it doesn't get as much charm. It's not just as masterful because you're f you're either quit the game or you're forced to learn how to parry. But in other games, uh, such as Tekken or any other fighting game like Street Fighter, uh, parrying is a very risky move, which not all the time are pulling off because uh, you can play without parrying. But when a parry happens, it changes the dynamic completely. A parry should be a high risk, high reward. Uh, as a designer, you must justify to the player why he should attempt to parry rather than simply evading or blocking. And at the same time, you must make a parry difficult enough so that players are both dissuaded to attempt to parry all the time uh, by getting punished or by failing them, but also give a, have, get that sweet spot where it's hard to do but accomplishable, which is not way too hard but this I think this depends on the game for example in Super Smash Bros the parry has a time window which is uh, quite decent but in Tekken Street Fighter or Sekiro it's very very small so this kind of depends of the skill level that you want for your game but even if you want to make a game a little bit more more casual or more uh, competitive uh, you need to take that into account to make the timing of the parry, but you need to get that sweet spot for the game that you're making. Of between achievable, being achievable, and being difficult. Here, in this uh, in this second gameplay, we can see how a lot of times the players, uh, well, the player that is performing the parry, is in a bad spot or can be hit really get uh, hurt but because of his skill because of a well-timed parry he turns it bike around uh, right back around and he kills the other one especially in this one which as you see he's in very just as that street fighter clip he's very low health but because he can parry he parries a move he gets an opening and he reposts right back at his opponent and having a parry in your game creates that dynamic. The fact that even if you're low health, if you're skilled enough, if you take that risk, you could just simply bait, block, and play defensive. But you can pull, you can, uh, like, apostarlo? <laughs> you can put it all into that one parry. And if it succeeds, it not only feeds, feels amazing, but also you get an opening to strike back. But do, but do you think that you can do the same thing, just blocking and, and reposting? Which one is the main difference between blocking and parrying? I, I know that you tried to to explain to us, but mm -hmm. I think that we, I, we are missing some nuances here. Okay, so yeah, I'll get into that. Uh, the thing about most of these games, uh, parrying, it's usually uh, a block that either uh, it blocks all damage, or it gives some kind of advantage. Uh, I have a video that will go into that later, but I will explain it here a little bit. Uh, okay. You can either, when you're blocked in a game, most of the time there's uh, there's a penalization for it. In Dark Souls, for example, when you block, uh, your, stamina, your stamina drains, uh, and if you get out of stamina, you are unable to block anymore. And in Sekiro, you have this stance mechanic, and if you block, your stance is hindered way more than if you parry it. So blocking and parrying are kind of the same in that you negate damage, but blocking usually has, uh, you're penalized for blocking because it's the safe choice, while parrying requires timing, skill, and it's a lot harder to pull off. And then evading, on the other hand, has kind of the same problem. When you evade, you are not maintaining your stance. You're not staying right where you are. You're repositioning, which can be useful a lot of times. But by evading, at least a traditional evade, Bayonetta, for example, and we'll see that later, has an evade that it's kind of a parry. But a regular evade is a repositioning, which you can work into counterattack. But the beauty of a parry is that you negate an attack 
of another enemy standing right where you are and you create an opening for yourself. That's yeah, what that's makes right. a par interesting. I think that may maybe will be something uh, useful if, if we take a look uh, or take an approach to, this, to the differences between parrying and blocking. If we see, uh, if, we, if we approach to these topics as a passive and active uh, standings or positions, you know, when usually if you just uh, uh, push the burden of blocking, you will be blocking any or any any kind of uh, of attack that is directed to you. But you will need to actively uh, parry the attack of the uh, uh, of your enemy, you know, in the specific window, and then in the specific window make, make this kind of of reports. I am not pretty sure if you are agree with me that a blocking is something more passive. And um, a parry is something more active. Yes, I completely agree. And I, I talked about this in the Monster Hunter specifically, but I agree that I should have speaked about this a little bit earlier. The whole concept of do I block, do I evade, or do I parry? Uh, I think I focused too much on the parry, but to showcase its importance, I think I should have talked about the block and the evade as well. I'll, I'll get onto that later because I think I have uh, explained that's myself. Okay, that's okay. It's, it's just a, it's just a, I thought that it, it, maybe this was a, a, a good moment to uh, make this kind of differentiation and, and, and list a couple of nuances because it's a little bit hard to understand. Yo, uh, uh, creo, que, creo que en español se entiende mejor cuando dices mm -hmm. bloquear y rechazar que cuando, que cuando dices block and parry. Yes. Y parry lo podemos entender como parada de bloqueo, pero también se puede entender como rechazar. Creo que entonces se entiende un poco mejor lo que la diferencia entre bloquear, que es ponerte detrás, detrás del escudo de forma pasiva y bloquear y punto, o parry, que es rechazar un ataque y aprovechar la ventana para hacer un repost o para tirarte para atrás. Porque yeah. un repost siempre es un contraataque. Yes, well, a good, a good word for it would also be deflect, maybe, which was used before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rechazar, uh, deflect. Yeah, I completely agree with with your comment. Um, but I think that we'll talk about it, about the debate, the block, block and the power and how they all work out. I will mention it later on uh, Monster Hunter section that I have. Uh, but for now, we'll be moving on. Uh, if there's any doubt or you feel like there's anything else I need to comment, please let me know. So for the player, uh, this balance of high risk, high reward, it implies, well, risk. A parry is an exercise in confidence, and the player chooses to believe in his skill while in the midst of peril for a chance to victory. And from the player's perspective, as Joan just said, this implies a conscious choice, that you, do, you don't just parry uh, in the same way that you evade and you run away from danger, or you block and you just stay in a turtle stance where you're safe. Parry is opening yourself to danger. To danger and uh, to get an opportunity based on skill to uh, to get an uh, to get an, an attack or an opportunity or a block an opportunity against the enemy basically you abandon the safety of a block you don't run away with an abate you stay right there and you face the attack straightforward with incredible skill and timing so you can use it uh, to your advantage that advantage can be that you stun your opponent in Dark Souls, that you do damage, uh, like in here in Monster Hunter, or that you get no chip damage, just like in Street Fighter and a lot of fighter games. Uh, meaning that if you, in a lot of games, if you block, you get a little bit of damage of the attacks that you're getting as a punishment for playing turtle gameplay. But if you parry a lot of times, that damage is either nullified or minimized as a reward for taking that risk. So while it is a dangerous move, players are incentivized in a lot of ways to do that move. Or de-incentivized to do the other moves, which is evading or blocking, and instead doing a parry. So we'll now look at this section of Game, uh, game Maker's Toolkit about parries, which I think talks a lot about balance and uh, mechanical and part one of you'll parrying. see in a lot of good combat systems. I'm of course talking about the parry or counter. This is typically when you hit the block or dodge button just as the enemy's attack lands, giving you some kind of bonus, often a lethal blow. 
These are super fun to pull off and a real test of timing that makes you feel amazing when they work, but they can become overpowered, drowning out the rest of the combat system and turning the whole thing into a waiting game and a simple test of reflexes. I'm not even exaggerating. If you've ever played the early Assassin's Creed games, you'll know the uh, joy of standing around with your sword up, countering one enemy after another. So how can we avoid this? Well, one way is to make parries more risky. You see, designers need to pick the exact moment during the enemy's attack animation that a parry is viable. Games like Batman are way too generous, making it effortless to counter every attack whereas something like Neo makes it a lot, lot tougher. You can also increase the punishment for missing a parry, like how if you mistime a dodge in Breath of the Wild, you'll be trapped in a recovery animation and vulnerable to being attacked. Another option is to limit the number of parries you can perform, like in Bloodborne, where you have to fire quicksilver bullets to stun enemies and leave them open for attack. That ammo limitation makes you think carefully about which moves you'll try to counter. Other games simply don't let the parry be a one-hit kill, in Bayonetta, dodging at the last second lets you enter a slow-mo witch time, while in God of War, a well-timed counter puts your enemy into a stun. Both help you, but you'll need to use the full combat system to actually defeat those enemies. So those are some ways to stop a game So, a special note to take from this video, apart from the differences as we talked earlier about nomenclature, uh, you could have parries that are translated into an attack, parries that are uh, blocking the attack and then moving away, kind of evading, but also parries that leave an opening to make a repost and attack right back at the enemy. And as we saw in these different points before, about making, uh, making timing important, the fact that there's a small window of opportunity, is important for the reasons that he states here. If you make, way, if you make parrying way too easy, like in Batman, it stops having meaning. It's just a move that you do because it's easy and then you... and it's incredibly overpowered. So, parry must have a difficulty element to it. It must have a slow time, but also uh, it doesn't only has to be difficult, it also has to be fair in the aspect that you are n uh, informing the player of the different attacks, making them distinctive, uh, so that the player can read that information and make a conscious choice to parry. Carlos. Yes. Te falta mucho, digo, porque en un principio tendríamos solo, nos quedan solo 5 o 10 minutos. Me queda esta diapo, la sección de Monster Hunter, que es muy corta y ya estoy. Pero yo creo que en 10 minutos estoy. Tal vez menos. We can spend at least, I don't, I don't know, five minutes more to questions and considerations. It will be nice. But I don't have so, so much time at least. You know, I don't know the rest of the people, so go on. Uh, I'm going to rush this then, but uh, I, should, I should be all right, I think. So, uh, as the last point uh, of this kind of series of points of how and why, we have uh, how, feedback. The outcome of a parry, and not, not only the fact that, uh, of the attacks that you can parry, but also the outcome, the parry must be clear and immediate. To succeed or fail drastically changes the subsequent player choices. And as we will see in this video, which is a lot, more, a lot shorter, we will have different parries. Here we can see this small bell. Listen. This thing tells you that you succeeded. Or here in For so Honor, the sparks and the metal clang. The, the game immediately tells you that you succeeded or that you failed. And that's super important because for both players, the player parrying and the player getting parried, the outcome of a parry is super important for the next decisions in combat. For either the player that's, that's parrying or the player that is getting parried. And then for the player, this involves strategy. Uh, as we said in the parry video, the possibility of a parry changes combat dynamic completely, involving baits, bluffs, and mind games. Here in Battle Right, we can see a mechanic which is the cancel mechanic. Meaning that in this in Battle Right, which is an amazing game by the way, and I recommend it you for all to play it. And Lunar Strike being used The player on the left is casting a spell. But as you can see, 
the other guy starts a counter and he immediately cancels it. The thing is, I personally think that because of how fast, like, he cancels the spell bef... It's like uh, 10... 100 milliseconds at most, he starts the counter and then he cancels, like, immediately. And that leads me to believe that that player was not planning in ending that spell at all. He was baiting a counter from his opponent. And that's the kind of dynamics a par includes. It's, it's like he's tricking the other player, isn't it? Yes. Tricking him, like, I'm going to cast a spell, I know that you are going to counter, so I'm going to spam the cancel a spell before I know that you are countering it, isn't? Hmm. Yes. Or something like that, tricking with the other player, yeah. He baited him into a counter, and because the other player didn't wait until the last second to counter, uh, he didn't wait until a projectile existed in the game for him, for him to counter, he got baited by the other player, which never in, wh whom never intended to end the spell at all. The player on the left baited the player on the right, and he can now use this advantage to hit him right after the counter finishes, because he, the other guy can't move until he finishes the counter, which sadly he misses. But you can see all this dynamic of I counter, this counter involves a, a restriction of an animation, a state, something that the other player can bait you into or can take an advantage from. So it's no longer if I can parry, but if I should parry, is the other guy baiting me into a parry. So in my opinion, a great parry has a clear and straightforward performance, but is nonetheless still difficult to pull off, with the result being immediate and a success gratifying. So all in all, easy to understand, challenging to execute, satisfying to accomplish. And here we'll see some small examples in Monster Hunter World, which is one of the main reasons I did this presentation. The long sword has the hindrance that you can only attack after parrying, meaning that uh, uh, you cannot turtle down and wait, just like in Assassin's Creed, for a parry. You need to be attacking to be able to have the parry available to you, which uh, incentivizes a more aggressive playstyle and countering exactly when you need to. A great sword, on the other hand, uh, only can only parry by cancelling an attack, but that's a very small time frame because when you have the sword in your hand and you're starting an attack, uh, starting to charge an attack, you cannot parry from a needle stance. And when you're charging an attack, you're charging an attack for about one second, one second and a half. So you have that time frame to parry. And if you time it wrong and you start to charge an attack and the monster doesn't come quick enough, you either parry the air or you make an attack. And once you're making that attack, you can no longer parry. So you get uh, butt-fucked by the monster. The charge blade uh, requires great timing, but he failure is heavily punished, meaning that when you try to parry and you fail, uh, you change a stance into the sword mode to the axe mode, and the axe mode doesn't allow you to block, meaning that if you fail a parry, you no longer are able to parry because you're in a different uh, weapon mode. So it involves a lot more risk for subsequent decisions. And the lance uh, is a lot more forgiving in parry, but it keeps you still. If you parry, if you try to parry an attack, but you don't get attacked, you keep still. And after you finish that parry, uh, after a little bit of time, you attack automatically, and then you need to attack again before you can parry. And if in that small time window, the monster attacks, there's little you can do about it, you cannot parry. So it also involves decision making. And this is what we talked about, the bait and the block. Uh, Monster Hunter includes this ability called Offensive Guard, which temporarily increases attack after executing a perfectly timed guard. This is an amazing skill, because it incentivizes risks and deters turtle gameplay. There's a lot of weapons that can block, they can also parry a lot of times, but they can just do a regular block. This skill gives all blocks the chance to make somewhat of a parry, giving you it doesn't give you extra defense or anything else, but it gives you an offense bonus. So instead of turtling down and making a, a block way beforehand, 
the game incentivizes you to block block just at the right moment, just before getting hit, so you get an offensive bonus. You can fail that and get hit, but if you succeed, you get an advantage. So you incentivize a risky playstyle to be active, as Juan said. Uh, and then, almost to finish, uh, it's not always necessary to add a parry. We made a game of our own not too long ago, which was a hack and slash. And we thought of making a parry, but the design of attacks to parry, the design of the attacks that you parry, are as important as the parry itself. The game's gameplay style and the combat might not fit the parry. The parry is a mechanic, is the way that you're making it. You can fit it in, but it's very important that you put it well. If you make a parry such as the parry in Batman, it's just way too easy to perform. So it is not simply a tool that you add to combat. It's something that you need to work on. Something that requires time and iteration. But it's awesome if you can put a parry in your game. Uh, this is a game that I did not do personally, but a fr uh, some friends of mine did, and I helped them play test and iterate. Adding a parry to your game creates dynamic combat, mind games, greater strategy, and a technique to master. And this character, this old man that you can see on the screen, had a parry. So in this game, uh, play, uh, enemies, players uh, shoot projectiles at each other, and there's two characters that can, one can shotgun projectiles, and the other one can shoot a ton of projectiles all over the place. And this old man, this character that can parry, can turn that, those devastating abilities right against the ones that shot them, if done uh, at the right moment. And that is a masterful ability that you learn to play, and most importantly, you turn the enemy's most powerful attack right against them. So you cannot mindlessly just shoot attacks to the enemy, the, the old man, because he can turn it right back at you if he has the chance. So in conclusion, if you can add powers to your game, uh, they improve combat with baits, bluffs, and comebacks. It's a meaningful choice for a player to take. It's a move that the player grows towards with mastery. So you add this progression about building towards a parry. And they're just super satisfying to perform. As I said, it's a, dis it's a display of confidence, skill, timing. It's something that you're proud to pull off. And then opinions and homework, which is the, the part that Juan wanted to get on. Uh, what games are uh, what are the games with the best parties that you've played? And this is kind of a question to the audience. However, because of time constraints, uh, we can go directly into the questions if you, if you have any. Yeah, right. Well, I think that is the way. Pienso que es una buena idea que hagamos este homework y que lo pongamos en clase o en preguntas de clase. Eso sería estaría sería interesante y yo personalmente creo que lo voy a intentar, Carlas. Uh -huh. eh, y en cualquier caso quería decirte que si bien mmm, no al 100% sí que me has convencido de que poner parry en los videojuegos es, es una buena idea, es una buena opción. <risa> después, de, de ver, después de ver esta, esta presentación tan bien hecha por, por, por diferentes aspectos, ¿eh, Carlas? Por un, lado, por un lado, por el aspecto gráfico y de presentación, se nota que has ido optimizando tus eh, habilidades para crear este tipo de PowerPoints y, y te ha quedado una presentación súper chula. Sí. A lo mejor has abusado en algún momento de los vídeos o de algún vídeo demasiado largo. Sí. También te diría, un, los vídeos son para ilustrar una cosa, 10 segundos y volverá a tu... A, si no, mírate tu vídeo y resúmemelo, ¿sabes? Es la única cosa que te diría sobre la presentación, pero por ejemplo, esta última imagen con una imagen de fondo introduciendo cada una de las frases poco a poco... En cuanto a la presentación, estás a punto de llegar al, 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 al nirvana de, la, de las presentaciones. ¿De acuerdo? Esto por un lado. Por otro lado, es el juego dentro del juego. Pero esto yo creo que se puede aplicar a muchas cosas, no solo al parry. Cualquier gran mecánica que cojas de un videojuego se puede convertir en un juego dentro del juego. Y el parry, tal y como nos, estás, nos, estás, lo, nos lo has estado explicando y defendiendo durante toda la, la presentación, es un juego dentro de un juego más grande. Tú estás jugando al Monster Hunter, estás cazando monstruos, pero en realidad, y esta es la, de, de, estas, de estos tres factores que destacabas, el, el, vuelve una, una slide para atrás, por Voy. favor. Eh, eh, 
satisfying to perform. El satisfying to perform es casi la más importante, diría para mí. Ah, por eso es la última. Claro, claro, claro. Es la más importante en el sentido de que la mecánica te puede ser, o sea, te, te, tendrás que masterearla para ser bueno en ella y tendrás que ir creciendo poco a poco, pero el hecho de, que, de colarla, ¿no? De, ¡Hostia, se la he colado! Eso es, es aquel momento que buscamos en un videojuego, ¿no? O, o aquel feedback, aquel game feel que queremos de, 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 que nos proporcione el videojuego. Y eso es un juego dentro del juego, porque no tiene nada que ver que estés matando monstruos o que, esté, o que te estén tirando barriles en la cabeza. Lo que, lo que mola es colársela es eh, aprovechar la ventana de oportunidad, no solo a través de la visualización y anticipación de lo que se nos radiografía, sino a veces, como se solía decir de mala manera, con putería, ¿no? con psicología, con no tengo suficientes datos y aún y así te la he colado, porque sé cómo eres, porque sé que me la vas a tirar. Esto en un juego de lucha, por eso has radiografiado tantos juegos de lucha, ¿no? es sí. donde llegas a máxima expresión. ¿No? Pero entonces yo creo que has hecho ya la, la reflexión perfecta cuando nos has explicado que no todos los juegos o no para todos los juegos tendría el mismo sentido. Y aquí es donde es, es cuando te decía te lo compro pero no al 100%. Estoy de acuerdo en que el parry es un juego dentro de un juego, ¿eh? Games Within Games, eh, pero estoy de acuerdo también en que no cuadra con todos los juegos de combate o de acción. En el sentido de que lo veo más en, en, en juegos en los que lleves un avatar, a lo mejor en primera persona o en tercera persona, pero no en isométrico y tan pequeño. Me explico. Uh -huh. Y tú, que conste que nos estabas enseñando un, un juego en el que considerabas que lo hacía bien y el avatar era muy pequeño, el personaje era muy pequeño. Pero a mí el deflect, el, el rebotar un, un, un ataque, no me cuadra tanto con toda la definición que has ido construyendo a lo largo de la presentación sobre lo que es el parry, porque el deflect, bueno, sí que cuadra en, en algún aspecto, pero no al 100%. Yo creo que, que falta esta presentación una última slide con un gran cuadro que diga esto es parry y estos son otros tipos de, de combate o de, o de defensa o de repost o de deflect o etcétera, etcétera, y hacer allí un, un, un poco de ejercicio nosotros mismos de meter qué es una cosa y qué es la otra. El parry queda muy claro en algunas de las slides que, has, que nos has pasado. ¿eh? El rechazar un, un, un golpe con otro golpe, no con un escudo en pasiva, sino con un golpe por mi parte, en el momento perfecto crear una ventana de oportunidad y entonces hacer algo más, no siempre un ataque. También puedes hacer algo más en cuanto a retirarte, en cuanto a esquivar, en cuanto a asustarlo, en cuanto a tirarlo al suelo, no siempre otro ataque, sino simplemente repeler su ataque con otro ataque. Y eso se puede convertir en un juego porque es un juego de, 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 de ventana de oportunidad. Igual que podría ser cualquier otro juego que utilice una ventana de oportunidad. ¿Sí? Sí. ¿Hay preguntas, chicos? ¿Tenido preguntas? No, ah. Más que... Bueno, si sí, en el fondo es una o pregunta. Que sea. Es que sí, me... eh, de entrada la presentación me ha encantado. Sobre todo me he fijado en lo que decías tú de las transiciones y te lo compro 100%. Es algo que hay que implementar ya. Y dejando esto un poco de lado, entrando más la presentación en sí, compro mucho la idea y me parece súper interesante también esto que entró Joan al final, de no todo el parry tiene que llevar a un repose, ¿sabes? Del, el simple hecho de hacer el parry, ganar esa, esa, esa satisfacción, esa sensación de fiero, que me parece una recompensa de puta madre y creo que está muy poco explorado cómo puedes hacer... Una, una respuesta a un parry que mole mucho sin ser un ataque, que es lo que hemos visto 50.000 veces, ¿no? Puedes hacer un parry, que esto significa que te puedes posicionar mejor, puedes hacer parry y esto significa que ganas como más recursos, o sea, desarrollar un poco más y no quedas en el... Y me parece que el ejercicio que has hecho de separar estas dos cosas y clarificar que no van de la mano, la verdad es que me ha abierto un poco la cabeza y a nuevas expectativas, que es lo que mola en el fondo. Sí. El, un problema que me encontré al empezar esta presentación es que no había un estándar. Es decir, cada juego decide que es un counter, cada juego decide que es el efecto de un parry, cada juego decide que es un repost. Entonces, no puedes establecer una definición perfecta de qué es lo que hace cada cosa, porque ni siquiera el mundo de los videojuegos parece tener un estándar. El propio, el propio señor, por decirlo así, del Game Maker's Toolkit... Habla de, sí, tenemos esta mecánica que es un parry o counter, y ni, ni siquiera dice repost, pero hay muchas escenas del vídeo donde hace bloquea un ataque y se pone a atacar. Es decir, 
que técnicamente sería un repost, pero no lo llama como tal. Eh, la, el mundo, la industria del videojuego, y creo que sus jugadores también tienen bastante interiorizado cómo funciona el tema de un counter con timer, sí. y después ya lo especifican siendo un parry, pero no hay un estándar, como he dicho al principio, de los efectos de cada cosa. Si un repost tiene que ir incluido en el parry, o es algo que tú haces voluntariamente, sí. se podría considerar lo mismo. Un parry bloquea todo el daño, bloquea un poco... No... Hay variaciones en cada juego, y por eso he dicho que pues eso, depende del juego. Uh, yo he hecho un intento de, de hacer intentar clasificar qué es cada cosa, ¿no? Y al final he considerado que, bueno, pues un repost sería cuando haces un parry y luego atacas. Incluyendo si atacas voluntariamente o si atacas automáticamente. Dicho esto, como por ejemplo el Monster Hunter, en la espada larga, hace eso automáticamente. Cuando haces un parry, haces un ataque en el mismo instante. No tienes la opción de no hacerlo. Uh, pero te compro muchísimo la idea de hacer parries que llevan a, a cosas que no sean necesariamente ataques. El... Por ejemplo, en For Honor tiene un parry uh, relativamente... Bueno, muy interesante. Uh, hay un movimiento que es un placaje que te deja abierto uh, a, a posibles ataques y tú puedes hacer un parry del placaje. Sí, uh, eso es lo del Warden, ¿no? Sí. Cuando... Vale, sí, eso que dices. Bueno, lo, lo, creo que lo hace cualquier... Puede, cualquier personaje puede hacer un placaje así rápido y el otro se puede volver. Uh, y lo interesante, ah, si, si no me equivoco, creo que uh, cuando tú haces un parry del block, uh, no dejas al otro totalmente estuneado, simplemente evitas que te bloquee. Es decir, bueno, creo que eso una... sería... Ese placaje es, es la idea que tiene Honor de lo que es un grab, entre muchas comillas. Sí. ¿eh? Creo, creo que podría ser un poco una iteración de lo que tú dices, en el hecho de que este placaje existe para dejar al oponente al descubierto, pero el otro tiene la oportunidad de bloquearlo y nulificar ese placaje, pero no deja al otro, no placa al otro personaje, simplemente evita que él mismo sea placado. Con lo cual aquí tendríamos un parry que, uh, más que evitar daño o volver a atacar, evitaría un opening. El otro está buscando un agujero y tú lo bloqueas con un successful parry. Sí, correcto. Pues bueno, que eso, que felicidades por la presentación, que ha molado mucho y muchas gracias. Sí, bueno, ya para terminar, solo por el gustazo. Solo el ruido, ojo. Es que es tan satisfactorio. El ting. Sí, la, la razón por la que hice esta presentación es este ting. En plan, es lo que dice el Juan. Hay muchas cosas del parry que son importantes, pero el ting es, es, me da la vida. 